looking at the book of Revelation, the book of the Bible, and uh, with it the most literary of all the books in the whole canon of scripture. I gave, uh, the first lecture I gave was related to the master image of the Bible and uh, tried to trace that image as it is presented in its nascent form in Genesis in the garden, which I suggested had something of a temple mountain about it and a high priest and so forth. Uh, if you want a biblical scholar that has written on this topic more exhaustively and more persuasively in a greater length, uh, G.K. Beale is very good on this, B-E-A-L-E, -E, uh, who has also written a commentary in the book of Revelation, a long one and a short one, I, ha I have them. And uh, I think he is sensitive to these features and it's, it's good to, to see them uh, as such. And everything that I said at the beginning there in that first lecture, I am going to repeat here, but I could have spent the whole lecture doing in the beginning what I, or, or in the end, in this last lecture with what I did in the beginning. Uh, but that would make a great deal of sense. Um, I want to look at the book of Re Revelation on its own or the book of uh, the Apocalypse because this is a revelation to St. John on the island of Patmos. It's interesting that it fits in with a certain view of uh, God as a, as a hidden being. Not unknowable. I I think I mentioned this in one class, modern scholarship tends to look on God in terms of that are amenable to empirical science, which is that we can't see him. And if we can't see him, we can't verify him. And if we can't verify him, then he's really unknown. Deus incognito. We can't know. And uh, the best of those types tend to think that God is necessary conceptually. And um, Jordan Peterson's making a great deal of this now in his biblical lectures. I think he ascribes to the idea of God as Deus incognito, an unknowable being, awesome, etc., and necessary uh, for human life and human happiness. But he does not read the Bible I in the terms in which I think it demands to be read, which is that it, it reveals a God that is, is hidden. Deus absconditus is the Latin way of writing this. He's hidden, and yet he reveals himself, and he reveals himself in his word, primarily. He also reveals himself in the created order. And so we can speak of natural law, and uh, we can speak of the signs in creation, and the psalmists speak of this, say, Psalm 8, which we heard about yesterday in chapel, if you were there. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies showeth forth the work of his hands, etc. So there's a sort of a revelation that we see in, in the natural order itself. But God primarily reveals himself in his word, and that's what makes this particular book, the Bible, a unique literary work. It reveals things that we could not know and would not imagine. Uh, even though it uses literary conventions and literary genres, and I'm going to talk about those, uh, it's the composite nature of all of these genres, particularly in the book of Revelation, which makes it unique. And what it reveals is uh, God and his purposes, which are, which are also unique. And so the primary literary genre, and I've got a whole list of them here on the screen, which I have here, and I'll pull it over here for the sake of the YouTube recording, if we can. And I'm not sure I can even. Yeah. There are, I think, multiple literary genres being presented here. Uh, all at once. And it, I think 
so there's no literary genre that will together reflect all of these, but I think I can see all of them here, and Riken mentions them as well. The dominant one is Apocalypse, which is right there in the title. It's called the Apocalypse. And Apocalypse quite literally means to take out from a place of being hidden. Uh, the, the word calypso in, in Greek, the verb, is to hide. An apo is to take out from being hidden. So an apocalypse is literally, it was before not seen, and now it has been pulled out, or the screen has dropped, if you will. So uh, we, we use this word in English in various uh, derivations. So a, a, eucalyptic, a eucalyptus tree is a, sh a tree that provides good shade, because the EU there is a, a, an adverb, actually. It provides... Uh, but can be used as an adjective. It provides good shade. It, it hides us from the sun. You have a question there? I was going to ask if apocalypse is a literary genre. Does that come from the Bible or does that exist outside the Bible? Good question. Is it a genre outside of scripture? Uh, I don't know. That's a good answer. It's, it's the answer that's truthful here. I'm not sure. It is prominent in scripture, and I haven't mentioned it thus far. And there are passages and places in the Old Testament that I didn't even deal with as such, and perhaps should have, but again, I, I want more time for this course, like most of my courses. Uh, but there are uh, particular books in the Old Testament that I would describe as apocalyptic, as a genre, and uh, one of them would be uh, Zechariah, which is very hard to read if you don't recognize that it's apocalyptic. And the latter half of the book of Daniel is likewise apocalyptic. But people tend to read the beginning of the book of Daniel up to about Daniel 7, and it's Nebuchadnezzar and you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego along with Daniel and his friends. And, and then it goes weird. <laughs> it, gets, it starts talking about um, things that are not explicitly historical uh, in the way that the book began, and further complicated by the fact that it moves into a different language at that point. Um, and I, I didn't deal with that at all. So there is apocalyptic in the Old Testament. Uh, I don't know if it exists outside of Scripture, but it is the dominant mode here, and to some degree, it is the most important of the genres insofar as it, it, reveal, it is really doing what the Bible itself is doing, which is acquainting us with God who is hidden from us. We can't see God. God is, in his uh, Christian theology, we'll talk him about, about him in terms of being um, invisible. And yet he is visible insofar as he reveals himself. And that goes all the way back to uh, when God reveals himself to Moses. And he asks who he is. And he says that I am who I am. Uh, a cryptic um, assertion, but full of import and meaning. God is being. He is the ground of being. Uh, he is the self-existent one. He has aseity, to use the term of the uh, theologians. He has uncreated being. He also creates the world which has being, and its being exists subsequent to his being. He is uncreated being. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, exist, if existence is the right word, but they have being uh, that precedes the created being, which is the account that we have in Scripture, that is revealed to us in Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, which in the book of Hebrews, uh, we, it's, it's declared that we know by faith. In faith. By faith, we know that God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, it's revealed. It was hidden, now we know. There are different accounts of the origin of things that are in the pagan authors. They're quite different. They see things beginning in chaos, not beginning out of nothing. But by faith, we 
read that God did it this way. Anyway, this is the primary literary genre, though, I would say, is Apocalypse. But I don't want to reduce it to that because there, it, it, that's one feature. But I'd say the dominant note is Apocalypse. And again, you can see this right here in the uh, text behind us, the revelation of Jesus Christ or the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And note that it is of Jesus Christ. And that's problematic. I mean, what do we problematic grammatically? Is it Jesus that reveals it? In other words, is he the subject of the revelation or is the object of the revelation? Is, is he revealing himself or is he revealing something else? It comes from Jesus, yes. Is it of Jesus? And the answer is most surely yes. Is the, both the subject and the object of revelation. I don't know what the proper grammatical term for that is. But right in the very beginning there, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his brother, to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to all the things that he saw. So these things, remember Jesus says that he did not know. They're asking him when these things would happen. And Jesus himself says that he, he, he doesn't know. No one knows but the Father, right? But now there, it has been revealed to the Son. That's the suggestion here at any rate. And that revelation is now being passed on and it is a, it's been signified to his angel who's now giving it to John who bears witness. So there's a lot of signification going on here and revelation. Remember the angels long to look into salvation. Even the angels long to know these things. So there's a sense of things that are hidden even uh, within, within the Godhead and, and within, certainly with the order, within the order of the angels, which are being revealed. The lid is being pulled back and now we can see. So that motif or that genre of apocalypse looms large throughout this whole account. And, and how to uh, access it then. So this is not just when we come to say we read, we tend to read things and we read things that are uh, comprehensible on our part. Like a story, it has a structure. I'm gonna, I, I'll talk about that today when we're speaking of the book of Revelation um, and, and a clear structure because the book of Revelation has a very strong structure, the most structured book I, I know of, actually. It's very strongly structured. But at the same time, it's very difficult to read if you want to read it as an account of, of history, which many have tried to do and failed in my mind. And it fails very quickly. Even at the level of visualizing, it fails. They want to read the, the images which they see throughout the account uh, as representational, even though the, uh, the images are, are often contradictory. So Jesus or, or John hears a voice behind him and he looks and what does he see? He sees, uh, here's the voice of a lion. He looks behind him and he sees a lamb looking as if he were slain. So associations of things that are are to not only totally different, but in some ways often opposite to one another. Here's a roaring of a lion. He looks and sees a not only a lamb, but one who looks as if he's been slain. These are contradictory images, so they're not to be seen as representational, but they're clear images. There's no, there's no getting away from the fact that we imagine. One way of... Uh, and, and this is the problem with interpretation because in, a gen in general, uh, the principle of interpretation that we use is that of mimesis, which is represent representation of reality. Eric Auerbach wrote a book on it. I've mentioned it already, uh, mimesis. And this is the principle of Western art. You represent the reality of the thing in a form and it can be a 
a narrative or story form or it can be in a poetic form, but you are representing a reality through your words. But here, the reality being represented doesn't fit with mimesis. It fits more with apocalypse, something that is hidden and is now being revealed. And even to describe it, we have to throw together things that don't really normally belong together. In fact, usually are contradictory to one another. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God. Same person envisaged there. The suffering servant, the, uh, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Those are revealed to be the same uh, in terms of how do you represent that? Those things that are actually usually utterly contradictory. That's what the, the struggle with reading scripture has been about is those things don't fit together. And yet we are saying that is exactly what is going on. God has showed his greatest power in the event at the, at the crux of the stories of the gospels, at, namely at the cross, where he's at his earthly weakest. That's where his strength is revealed because he destroys sin and death there and then rises from it. Now, this is a paradox. Anyway, so I say there are multiple literary genres and I, I probably want to put apocalypse first, but it is just one of the modes of, of reading here. And when I say that, it is also written in, an arch in archetypal terms. I'll say more about that in a second here. But let me talk here briefly about this as uh, apocalypse. And it is common to the Hebrew audience for sure. And it is well known in the early Christian era. And it's very, but it is strange to modern readers, that's for sure. Now, apocalyptic works are visionary in the sense that they appeal to our eyes and yet without represent being representational. I, I have, in the 80s, when I was not a Christian, and there used to be uh, programs on TV uh, by people who were promoting end times readings of scripture, and they used to depict this. It was always on the book of Revelation. I used to watch them, I found them fascinating. And they, and they, would, they would visualize, the, they put on the screen what I was re what they were also reading in the book of Revelation. And it would be again these lurid pictures. And I, I, f <laughs> I found it extraordinary, but it's, it's the wrong way to read scripture. And yet the other thing, note there here, there is a sense that it is history because it explicitly flags up the fact that it is. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So there is a sense in which it is meant to be applied and understood historically. It has to be. I even put that here as a genre, a, a history. And again, how, does it, how do archetypes fit with the idea of historical? genre. These don't fit at all. And yet plainly they are being presented here uh, right from the beginning of the book of Revelation as ways that I must read this text. Uh, ap apocalyptic. It has a number of identifiable characteristics and all of them pretty much are seen here. Um, they tend to be dualistic in the sense that they portray a world divided along the lines of good on the one hand and evil on the other. And it is also, and this fits in with what I just said about history, they tend to be eschatological because they refer to the eschaton, Greek word, teaching us about the last things. And note the ease with which we can slip from the last things to the end times because, of course, the last things are referred to the time is near. So, of course, there's a pressure to understand things in that way. And it's not wrong. It's 
So the eschaton and eschatology, so it, it is revealing how things will pan out in the end. So the master image I spoke of, which is there in a very incipient and very rudimentary form in the book of Genesis is now fully fleshed out at the end of the Bible where we get the, a declaration that uh, of Jesus that behold I am making all things new and also that he has brought about a new heaven and a new earth. A new heavens and a new earth, a direct quotation of the very first line of Genesis. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And now he's creating everything new. Not just the, he not just the earth by the way, the heavens also. And we get then the picture of what? A bride coming down from God, which is a city, the heavenly Jerusalem. An image. Now these are referred, as I say, to eschatological and the basic unit of presentation is, is ecstatic. It, it's, I don't mean ecstatic in the sense of exciting, although it is exciting, but in a sense it stands outside of ourselves because that's the word ex what ecstatic means. To stand outside. So there's a way of looking at history. History narrates events, past events. It, do it doesn't predict future events. But this, this apocalyptic does. It is a way of looking at history that is almost, it's standing, let's stand outside of this and look to way, the way it's going to be consummated, fulfilled. And for those who are on the side of the good, obviously it is rather exciting, delightful. It also tends to be messianic, I should say. It, it centers on the appearance of the divine Messiah. And with the dualistic framework that I talked about, we find angels present with the good and demons with the, with the evil. And there's animal sim symbolism that reflects the same thing. And also numerology. I'm not even going to get into that. Numerology is its own thing. But even the, even the numbers written in here are apocalyptic in their intent. And in general, the, the number that is most prominent here is, are, are twofold, seven and four. The, this is uh, an epistle to the seven churches. And seven is a, a, a potent biblical number that goes back all the way to Genesis 1. Right? The seven days. God created the heaven and the earth, and six days on the seventh day he rests. And so on the, re the rest, there's a sense of completion, or there's an almost the, the six days up to that point have an eschatological end, which is the seventh day. When God is worshipped and he is uh, pleased and rests and restores all creation. So the number, the set, number seventh of completion is very important here. I'll come to that when I look at the structure of the work. But the idea of uh, animals uh, and beasts doing the talking is... Uh, seems rather remote from our experience uh, until we go to children's literature where we see it all over the place. Uh, also, color is part of the apocalyptic. Uh, white is associated with Christ and, and the saints and the, army, the armies of heaven and God's uh, throne of judgment. And its antithesis in this book is red. Red is always associated with evil in the book of Revelation. It's associated with warfare. It's associated with the dragon in uh, book 12, which I'm going to spend more time on briefly. Uh, and also the whore of Babylon and her beast in Revelation 17 is described as uh, the scarlet, woman of scarlet. So red has connotations of evil. I realize in some cultures red has different associations. Isn't red a marriage color in, is it Japan that they wear red for, I can't remember even. But white and these, these color associations uh, are, are not universal, they're particular to scripture. And need to be understood in those terms. 
So apocalyptic is the first way in we, uh, or lens, if you will, in which to view this. Uh, a second is story, and I think story, I could say narrative, but story is a better way of putting it because we're not just being told uh, a chronological account, which is what a narrative would suggest. We looked at Old Testament narrative, and it was narrative. It wasn't just a story, it was a narrative. Whereas here we're getting a, a, a more complete sense of, uh, of unity. It is using the narrative principle. And uh, stories have in common what this book of Revelation does, which is that it, it entails a plot conflict. That is what unifies it. The conflict between what I talked about, the dualistic features of uh, apocalypse, there's good and there's evil. And the clash of good and evil is what unifies the plot of the book of Revelation. It is a spiritual struggle. Now, this again exists rather uneasily with the idea that this is an account of history and time, because again, time is a condition and a limitation. God is immortal, and he is also eternal. He exists outside space and time, and yet the account we're being told happens in space and time, and and yet it is of spiritual entities, and spiritual entities are also not bound by space and time. They can involve themselves in space and time, but they're not limited in the same way, which is why we can't see them. And yet they're not of the same order as God who pre-existed the created order. The angels are also created. So there's a pot, plot conflict on a spiritual level, which involves a whole subcategory of character conflicts. Uh, and I'll just list, list some of them, in, but you can read about them yourself. There's Christ on the one hand, the Messiah, and Satan on the other hand, the Antichrist, if you will. There are saints on the one hand, and we're, there are the followers of the beast on the other. There are, there's the Bride of Christ on the one hand, the heavenly Jerusalem, and there is the, uh, the great whore, the whore of Babylon the Great, again associated with the city. Two women, two cities. We have the Lamb and the Dragon. We have uh, the angels, uh, that go forward under Michael's banner, and we have the dragon's angels that oppose them. And likewise, uh, in similarly dualistic terms, and this is why I presented Apocalypse first, uh, we have the heaven uh, against the earth, and the earth is here being presented as holy, sinful, and utterly opposed to God. We also have a bottom, uh, uh, along with the sinlo sinful earth, we have the bottomless pit. Easy, easy to imagine in terms of hell being under the earth, then, just visually, conceptually. Although, remember, it's not representational, so nobody actually ought to conclude that if we dig down, we'll find hell. Though maybe we would, I have no idea, but I don't think that's the way it, it's intended. It'd be a good reason not to dig down, then. It's what the dwarves do in Tolkien's <laughs> account. They find a Balrog down there. They dug too deep, too greedily. And we get the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, versus the great city of evil. And I already said that. So along with the plot conflict, there is conflicting actions. Uh, and the actions have a trajectory which is itself apocalyptic. The one, let's say the... Uh, Babylon the Great is, is uh, inclined towards destruction. And the destruction there is presented in Revelation 17. Whereas the New Jerusalem it will be exalted and restored and healed. So it's when, it, when we say, when God says, or Jesus says, behold, I'm making 
all things new. He doesn't say, he does not say I'm making all new things. So it's not trash everything before and start things from scratch. He is restoring, and that's the, this is the emphasis there, what is already existent is being purified of its wickedness and restored to its, uh, its initial luster and brilliance and perfection and holiness and goodness. And that's clear in the account in Revelation 20 where uh, the denizens of the heavenly Jerusalem are having their tears wiped from their eyes. And there's no more sickness or sorrow or pain or, di or death. All those things are gone. Those things are gone, but the good things are not. Right? So that it's not clear it all out. Let's start over again. Creation 2.0. And that will affect, by the way, our view of human culture. The cultural uh, uh, mandate given in Genesis is to uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill, and subdue the earth. Well, the earth is corrupted by sin. What place is there for human culture then if it's so corrupted? Well, there is a place insofar as it's godly and will stand the test of time, the apocalypse. Are there good things, good works done in this life that will stand? Well, yes, and they will be healed uh, of their wounds and their iniquity will be cast out from them and all the works of death with it. Uh, but in general, there's the, the, a, an opposition and a conflict between uh, a timeless eternity, which, is the, which will mean the deliverance of believers and everlasting life, and a temporal history which is associated with all manner of misery. And it has, even though it's going to be contradicted by its sevenfold character, which is highly repetitive, uh, there is a sense of a linear uh, structure here. Things are happening in a direction with a beginning and an end. And that's characteristic of a story. It has an end. It has a beginning, it has an end. And there is something that happens in between. Now this is not a smooth narrative flow. It is more like uh, um, somebody suggests, and it, Riken suggests it here, it's like a kaleidoscopic sequence of visions and pictures and sounds and images and events. And it, you don't stick with one image for very long. You immediately flip to a new one. But there's a clear sense of progression in the, the story. It, as in the book of Revelation, seen as a story. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, briefly uh, in, a, in a second. Let me move on to seeing it as, as drama. All of which we've looked at already, right? We've looked at story. Uh, we, have, we didn't look at apocalypse. I, I was saving that for this class. Uh, but we have looked at drama and we have looked at epic. So what are the features of a drama that we see here? Well, um, dramatized scenes are recurrent throughout the account. We have characters in highly elaborately described settings. We get speeches, we get songs. When I say drama, I mean it in the same sense as the drama of the book of Job. It's not meant to be depicted on stage. It is a closet drama. And there are dialogue, little bits of dialogue, and there are songs. There are lots of songs, even, even hymns, if you will, because they're dedicated. The songs are always, without exception, to the praise of God. So these are hymns. We just looked at him last, the last time we met. So the Riken suggests, and I think it's helpful if you understand what is meant by this, it's more of a pageant than a drama. Brief scenes telling the end of history. So it's highly, it's highly theatrical and, uh, and more like a, a pageant. 
Um, we don't have pageants these days. Think of a Christmas pageant. What do you have at a Christmas pageant? Just scenes, and the scenes are well-known scenes, and they're related to the birth of Christ. And sometimes uh, you'll, you'll see it presented as a story, and there'll be a narrator, and they'll, they'll try and um, interweave more sense to the story, but in a Christmas pageant, it's usually put on by little children, and you've just got little children dressed up as the three wise men, or the three angels, you've got Mary and Joseph, you have a scene, and, you're, and the kids are not really even capable of, of speaking very well. If you get them to remember the lines, you've, you've done well. But that's the pageant. You're seeing something and you know what is going on roughly. But you're not trying to uh, put too much of a story onto it, although an adult could do that and may do that. And, and some pageants have more of a narrative thread to that than the other. And the narrator is usually an adult or an older child which is, who's giving sense to the pageant that we see before us. But that's more like what the drama is here. There's a sense of, of pageantry about it. Grandeur in the scene. It's, it's something that needs to be depicted and is done so with reverence and all. Uh, finally, epic. What sense epic? Uh, when I say epic, I teach the epic repeatedly uh, here at Tyndale. I introduce every first year student in my class to an epic. It's the very first thing they read. It's from Homer. I've always done the Odyssey. I sometimes regret I don't do the Iliad, but uh, we do the Odyssey, and we also do Virgil's Aeneid shortly thereafter, and we end up in the second semester with Milton's Paradise Lost. All three are epics. We also do Dante and various other works, but we always do those ones. What are the features of epics there? Well, there are epic, there's an epic style here, which is not to be found elsewhere in scripture. It, there's a sense of greatness about what we're being told. Sometimes they use epic similes. The feet of God or Christ are like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. Epic similes. And I mentioned the loud voice, like a lion roaring. Those are epic similes. They're not extended, but still they, they have a sense of the king of the beasts, a great terrifying roar. Uh, we also find one of the features of epic language is an epithet. It's a title, and the titles here are grandiose. They're exuberant. They're ecstatic. Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. A whole series of titles listed on, just like when Aragorn is brought out in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, he's Aragorn, son of Arathorn, the heir of Elendil, the, and you can list the whole series of titles. To, if you're not aware of the importance of this man, let me list all of the ways in which his importance is brought together from a different thread. That's what's happening here. Doesn't happen with even a character like uh, Odysseus or Achilles or Aeneas. He, he does not have the manifold titles that, that Christ is given. Um, other epithets, the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. What a title that is. Or the commonly used one uh, in Christian circles, Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lots of epic catalogs as well. Ca by, by catalogs, I mean listing of things. We're, we have a list of the beings around the throne of God in heaven. We have a list of the tribes of Israel. We have the lists of the types of jewels that are inlaid in the heavenly city and the gates, the 12 fold structure there. So there's a grandeur and a depth to it. And uh, it is full of allusions to the Old Testament. Allusions. In other words, pictures conveyed through 
terms that remind the reader of another passage earlier in scripture and here thrown together and often from very different and sometimes disparate places in in the Old Testament now being pulled together in one place and, and the effect of that is again that of apocalyptic. So what was hidden in the sense of scattered, disconnected in the past is now crystallized, brought together in a way that now it all makes sense. There's a purposiveness to it which is being thereby uh, signified. And I'm told there are over 350 allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. In fact, one scholar that I used to uh, know in, in Durham, Mark Bonington, said that the, basically the entirety of the book of Revelation is a strung together series of Old Testament allusions. There's one after the next. Sources, if you will. So th this, is where <laughs> this is where it's interesting when y you get the uh, New Testament scholars who I, I told you how they take apart the uh, gospel narratives and f try to find a source for all of Jesus' sayings. It's really easy in the book of Revelation because the sources for, all the, for the, the narrative, you can just find it chalked throughout the Old Testament. Just read the Old Testament and you will find all the words pretty much put together for this. And so there is a sense of continuity, and then I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis. He, t he comments in uh, his preface to Paradise Lost about epic in general. He's talking about Milton's epic as a secondary epic in, in the tradition of, of Virgil. But he says that continuity is an essential of the epic style. And of the, there's an enormous onward pressure of the great stream on which you are embarked. So you're in a a stream of water and the stream is moving forward and it's moving rapidly and it picks it's picking up speed even and Lewis describes the Scott style as ritualistic I, I just called it a pageant ritualistic incantatory or hymnic if you look what we talked about last time Possessing grandeur, capable of creating the true epic exhilaration. That comes with reading an epic. When you read an epic, you have the sense of something uh, beyond normal telling. And hence, you, uh, the epic writer always appeals to the epic muse to tell the story. Too important not to come from God. So the content is epic, um, but so is the style. And epics are almost always with, have the same dualistic features I've mentioned here. There's a conflict between good and evil. In the Odyssey, it's between the suitors who represent evil and represent the forces of uh, Poseidon, the earth shaker, who creates chaos, destroys order, and Odysseus, on the other hand, who represents the power of Zeus, the heavenly beings, justice, or wisdom. He's, he represents wisdom. So there, again, the, 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 those apop apocalyptic features, the dualism of good and evil, is there in the Odyssey, same thing in the Aeneid. Aeneas represents the good, represents, uh, in this case, Rome and the reign of Venus, as opposed to the evil, which is rep represented in this case by Juno and the Carthaginian Empire. But there is an empire that is opposed to this. So again, there's a sense of dualism in all epics. There's a good, uh, a good character and a good cause and a good side, and then there's an evil opposed to that. And in the end, the good triumphs over the evil. And so there are, uh, that's, that's one feature here. Here it's even more so starkly presented. In, in Milton's case, he presents it but, uh, in Paradise Lost, a conflict between God and Satan, between heaven and hell, right? Likewise here, except that here uh, the setting for the action is cosmic and it includes heaven as well as earth and hell. There's a lot of discussion of heaven here in a way that is not characteristic of scripture. We have very few 
passages in the entirety of the, of the Bible where heaven is being discussed. Can you think of any? <coughs> we saw it at Job, that epic account. God's Satan is walking around the heavenly places, accuses Job and so forth. But otherwise, not a great deal. There's some. But here there is a great deal. Jesus refers to, to heaven repeatedly. He also refers to hell repeatedly. It's very interesting. Those who think that, that uh, the church invents hell, Jesus refers to hell more than any other writer in the whole of the scriptures. But we find that there is something akin to, in the pagan epic, the council of the gods, we have that here in the divine throne room. And what we find is characteristic of the council of the gods is they are telling us how things are going to work out. It's been fated that this such and such happens and there's a conflict within the divine council usually. Poseidon opposes Jupiter or, J or Zeus and Athena appeals to Zeus and says, you know that Odysseus has always been good to you and he's fated to come home. Why will you not let him go, come home? It must be so. This is how history pans out. You can't resist this. Why are you stopping this? Uh, same sense here, but not now in the sense of fate, but rather of providence. God has intended from the outset for a certain outcome, and now it's being revealed. It was hidden, and now it is not so. And there will be a hero that will conquer the armies that oppose his righteous rule. Uh, mentioned in Psalm 1, by the way, and Psalm 2. Psalm 2 in particular. Conquering hero. So it has that epic sweep to it. Comments or questions? Written in archetypal terms. Let me say something about the archetypal terms uh, here. Uh, but they're, they're in keeping with uh, to some degree the dualism I talked about already. Uh, but these are familiar archetypes that are found throughout literature but, and are particularly strong here. Um, but the world is presented of, of the book of Revelation is presented in very elemental terms. This is a world of life and death. Uh, lots of references to blood. There's, there's a lamb, there's a dragon, there's a beast. There's light and darkness. There's the waters that are living. And then there, there are those that are dead, namely the sea. Uh, there is war. There's scenes of harvest. I already talked about the color, but there's a bride and a throne. And there are jewels. There are gold. Lots of references to rising and falling. Heaven is presented as high and light, if not white, often white. Uh, the bottomless pit is low and black. These are archetypal associations. You find them throughout literature, particularly epic literature, but, but all, throughout all literature, actually. And the, as it moves on, particularly beginning in Revelation 12, which is sort of a, key, a hermeneutic key to understand what's going on. It's the most uh, straightforward in a sense. Uh, we get a spiritualized version of very familiar archetypes. We have a woman in, in distress. In this case, the distress is that of childbirth. Marvelously delivered from an enemy. The dragon. We have a white horse who kills the dragon. Sounds like sounds like uh, heroic stories. You know, Sir Gowan, the Green Knight. We have a wicked prostitute finally exposed who was deceiving before that point. Her identity was not known. She was tricking people, leading them astray, just like as we saw in Proverbs 1 to 9. There was a lady wisdom and there was a prostitute who was deceiving, tricking, both of them speaking in the streets. Uh, we, have the, we have a marriage scene. There's a triumphant hero who marries his bride. There's a wedding and a grand celebration that comes with that and a feast and a palace which is glittering with jewels. 
And there the bride and the hero live happily ever after. And beneath all that, then there's a sort of a journey motif. It, it, as I say, it's, it has a strong sense of pushing towards an eschaton, but it, it, it's presented as a, a, a journey, if you will. But now it's not just for an individual, but it's, it's the world has a journey. It's, it's going, pressing towards a fulfillment. I find that the book of Revelation is, in some sense, the hardest book to read, and in some sense, it's the easiest book to read. It really is easy to read, because you know what it's about. You, if you want to get down into the exeg exegesis of the text, you find yourself frustrated. It's very hard, but you take it as a whole, and I, oh, I know what this is all about. It's the conflict between good and evil, and the good wins in the end, and not without considerable problems along the way, but still. So that is the m multiple literary genres that are employed there. I say apocalyptic is the, the probably the dominant one, but it is, it, it's only one. I won't, would not want to ignore the story or the drama or the epic features that are there. But it has that dualistic quality and the good versus evil quality and also uh, the sense of something that was hidden and is now being revealed. And Revelation gets clearer and clearer and clearer as it gets more, as it gets closer to the eschaton. So with that said, now I can push this out of the way. And I want to talk about the structure of the book. I think I have to pull this off for a second just to get it out of the way briefly. Yeah, it works. The structure is, I've put it out there behind me. There's a prologue at the beginning. Oh, I, I haven't mentioned yet, but this is going to be related to it. It's written in the context of an, it's an epistle. It's a letter. It, so it has a, an epistolary framework. It begins with references to a letter and it concludes with the references to letters. So these are like bookends or a framework. Within that framework is the apocalyptic epic drama, which is in the middle. And the pattern of events, by the way, and this is part of what makes it clear that it is uh, a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not like from Jesus Christ, who has revealed this, but it's of Jesus Christ because he is the hero being depicted in the story. The one telling the story, telling it to John, he's also the hero in the story. Uh, but the account is roughly the same, in fact, almost exactly the same as the pattern of events in Jesus' Olivet Discourse. So if you go to Matthew 24 and 25, it's called the Olivet Discourse. Read the story of events there. If you want a brief rendering of what we're going to read in the book of Revelation, go there. And it really does follow the same pattern. Same pattern of events laid down, which, again, uh, helps us to support the thesis which I've presented already, which is that we're being given an account of history. This will happen, and then this will happen, and then this will happen. And what is that pattern? Well, in, in the Olivet Discount, th there are five phases there. It, there's the beginning of the whole thing, which is there are wars and earthquakes and famine and false teachers. That's how he begins it. Let's see if I can put this here. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Oh, I've already just said this anyway. But you can see for yourself. Here's the structure. There's a prologue. There are six sevenfold units. I'll expand on that section in a second. And then there's an epilogue at the end. That's the general structure. I'll put this on here and see if I can throw this up here. Note here in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, 
and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. So look at this. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Do you not see all these things? And see what? They're pointing to the temple, and he's saying, do you not see all these things? And what he means then, now he expands on. <laughs> the disciples came to him private, privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? Because they know he's referring to something other than what he sees here, because they said this temple is going to be brought down. And eventually it is, of course, in 70 AD, the, de temp the temple is destroyed. And not only destroyed, it's uprooted. It, it, it was so hot that even the foundations were pulled up. And the fire. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And now he gets to it. And this is the first of them, as I say. See to it that no one, uh, take heed that no one will deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay, so that's phase one. Then come the persecution of Christians, phase two, nine to 22, and the great tribulation or whatever. So the great, a great persecution such that unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. That's phase two. Phase three, false Christs and false prophets. 23 to 28 here. False Christ, false prophets come. Phase four, uh, natural disasters. We've already had that in phase one, but uh, the appearance of Christ and the harvesting of the elect. And then finally, and this goes on for the majority of this, the, the coming of the Son of Man. And then from here onwards, all the way through 25, final judgment. And about that, he says, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of man be. And what were the days of Noah like? Noah was prophesying judgment, imminent, and he was ignored, ridiculed. And they didn't see and then it came. So look at that, and then look at what I said at the beginning of Revelation 1, and you can see a pretty clear structure that falls in the same. Now re revealed. So that's the structure in the unity. It, it follows uh, a very manageable structure. So the prologue there is right here in chapter 1. In chapters two to four, we have the letters to the seven churches. And I emphasize this in the lecture on the epistles. These are not letters in the sense that we write them. They, they have a literary form. They have a greeting, a salutation, etc. very clear structure. And the climax of these has an eschatology as well. There's a, there's a sense of a, a conclusion. There's not just seven, but there the climax of the seven epistles is a vision of heaven itself. I won't go through all the letters because we don't have time, but let me just look at Revelation 4 here, and I will show you. And it's the throne room of heaven. That comes at the end of the seven epistles, right? So the seven churches. The seven churches are themselves characteristic of the apocalyptic genre that's presen been presented here and the sense that things are, are being more and more revealed, but they're also universal. So there's seven particular churches. They're, they're mentioned by place and name. They have historical context. And, and if you have preaching on this, they will talk about the context of each of the particular churches. And they are quite different, but they represent the church in general. I've heard people talk about the eighth letter of the churches and stuff. It drives me crazy. Somebody trying to be clever and 
Or the, but the seventh letter, this is a complete, this is a complete number. There are no more letters to the churches. This is the letter to the churches. The book of Revelation is the letter to the churches. And at the end of it, a throne room. So it, again, it has the sense of eschatology there and pushing the churches towards God. Then we move on to the, the six sevenfold units. What are these sevenfold units? Well, it starts off with the seven seals. And a seal is something that you have in, in a letter, interestingly. Right? You seal it with, with wax, with hot wax and an insignia on the seal. And you, the letter is hidden until the point when somebody breaks the seal. And now you can read what's inside of it. And it's a letter from usually in a very important figure to his intended audience. So it begins with, again, something that's highly apocalyptic, a reference to seven seals. That is in chapters 5, uh, 6, and 7, and right at the beginning of chapter 8, where... At, where the conclusion of this is what? So the seven seals are all broken. And when the seventh is opened, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. The silence has a sense of expectancy. Like, let's think of a plot where things are getting more and more and more and more intense. And then finally you break the seventh and it's just like the intake of breath. This is like a top of a roller coaster. <laughs> it's going up, 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 up. You get to the top and then <gasps> the big, or before a long dive underwater, you're, the big plunge is about to take place. It stops. What do we get then? The same pattern. But now it's not seals, it's trumpets. Trumpet comes at the end of a proclamation or to tell you of a proclamation. Uh, the, the Queen of England just died. There were trumpeters there, heralds. So we go to the seven, from the seventh seals from chapters five to seven, it, which concludes with silence for half an hour, then to the seven trumpets. These go take place from chapters uh, eight all the way to ap chapter uh, 11, the end of chapter 11. I'll show you here. And at the seventh trumpet, and again, as there's a sense of prog progress here, more and more intense. There were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So that's the outcome of it all. That's the outcome of the book of the Bible, the, the whole of Revelation, by the way. But that's the same throughout the seven. The seven, the six sevenfold units are doing the same thing over and over and over, but more intensely, more ecstatically, with greater distress on the one hand and exaltation on the other. And he shall reign forever and ever and the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks. And we have then here a clear hymn. Praise, this is what they're saying. Note, I love the fact that they actually present it as a hymn here. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake and great hail. And then it moves on. So the seven trumpets having been uh, blasted, trumpeted, we move on to the seven great signs. And the seven great signs, the first of them is the famous passage of the woman, the child, and the dragon, which is so important in Milton's Paradise Lost. The seven great signs. The first of them is the dragon's war on the son, the woman, and the woman's offspring. That's the whole of Revelation 12. But that's only the first of the signs. The second sign is in Revelation 
uh, 13, the beast coming up from the sea. The third sign is the beast coming from the earth, also in Revelation 13. The fourth sign is the lamb on Mount Zion. Note it's the lamb that's on the mountain. I talked about that master image. The, the fifth is angelic messages of judgment. The sixth are the reaping of the earth, and the seventh is the reaping of judgment on the wicked. That'll be the end of Revelation 14. Let me come to the end. I've consistently done the end, the final passage here. And that's what we get right here. So the judgment on the wicked, where they get what it, so the reaping of the earth, and then there's the reaping of the grapes of wrath on the wicked, which becomes the Steinbeck novel. I so say you can't read uh, Western literature without a biblical knowledge, I think. You just don't get it. You miss, you miss the references all over the place. And the winepress of the wrath of God, and the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs, a symbolic number. But that's the, that's the last of the seven great signs. Okay, so we've had seven seals, number one, seven trumpets, number two, seven signs, number three, seven bowls of wrath. So it begins, it concludes, the seven signs conclude with wrath. Now wrath will be the dominant theme. Seven bowls of them being poured out. A little bit of a prelude to it. And then we get the uh, seven. So a little bit of a prologue. When I say a little bit, the whole of chapter 15. And then the bowls of wrath are poured out. And what do, we, what do they pour out? I'll just go through them because they're presented quite closely together in Revelation 16. Seven bowls. And now what are they? So 15 is is a prologue talking about wrath. It's a lot of discussion of that. And now, what are the seven bowls? Well, they're sores, seas turning to blood, waters turning to blood, men being scorched, darkness and pain, the Euphrates, the great river being dried up, and then finally, the earth being shaken, just like in the Olivet Discourse. And the earthquake is a sign of the final judgment against evil. Poured his bowl in the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and a great earthquake. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God Remember Daniel, how it concluded with reference to Babylon? That wasn't Babylon, it was Nineveh. One of the great cities of the earth. Here, the great Babylon, who's associated with all of those, and probably it here has a historical equivalent in, the, in, in Rome, but representing the cities that oppose God's righteous rule, beginning back in the land of Shinar, where the Tower of Babel was constructed, to give her the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. When every island fled away and the mountains were not found and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone had the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. So those are the seven bulls. And finally then we come to the seven events of judgment, final judgment. So this is the sixth of the seven. And we get the judgment of, of, of Babylon, first of all. And that takes two whole chapters. The judgment of Babylon are in Revelation 17 and 18. That's the first of the seven events of final judgment and consummation. What we don't expect, and this is where the, the, the end of the, the, the sixth of the seven fold units starts to look much clearer and more triumphant. 
So the first event of final judgment is wholly negative, only negative. Judgment of Babylon. But with the second is in 19. And it's decidedly different. So the 19, heaven exalts over Babylon. That's the beginning of the second. And we get the marriage supper of the Lamb being spoken of here. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be gla re glad and rejoice and give him glory. Uh, then we get the Christ on his white charger coming forth. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flames of fire. And on his robe and on his thigh a name was written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that second uh, or, or third event uh, is concluded in verse 21. The rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the, on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So that's the third of the events. The fourth of the events is the binding of, suit of Satan for a thousand years and a millennial reign of Christ being ushered in. Right? That's, uh, so the binding of Satan and the millennial reign of Christ uh, verses 1 to 6 here. And the uh, crushing of Satan's uh, reign in verses 7 to 10. That follows. And then final judgment comes. 11 to 15. And only after that final judgment, then we finally get the description. But let's look at this great white throne judgment. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. So this is part of the picture of restoring all things new is the old creation. Everything that was in it is, is that has been marked by sin in any way is, is now fleeing from God. God alone remains and everything good with him. Everything else is flees. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So all that were dead are brought to judgment and then cast into a lake of fire. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And the conclusion of this, the seventh of the events of uh, final judgment and consummation is the description of the new heaven and the new earth. And this one really goes on long. So it's a little bit confusing in the sense that even though there's this pattern of sevenfold units, sometimes one of the units takes up a long place in the story. And this is one of them. So the description of the new heaven and the new earth begins here in 21 verse 1 and carries on all the way into chapter 22. And then we come to the epilogue, which I said is at the end of all this. And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So the other one had fled away. It, f it fleed from God's face in terror. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Very interesting. I've already said that the, that the sea picks up connotations of evil throughout, uh, old, throughout the, the Bible. And so it's no longer a reference to a body of water, but a reference to... to um, satanic evil and therefore in the new heavens and the new earth since there is no more evil there's no more sea it's gone there's water in heaven there's not 
in the new heavens and the new earth there's no sea because of the strong associations symbolized by it. Then I, John, saw the holy city coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now remember, Jesus, one of Jesus' epithets is Emmanuel, God with us. And now God will be with us. Also in John's uh, prologue there, or the hymn at the outset of John's gospel, it says that Jesus dwelt among us. He pitched his tent among us. He had a tabernacle, his body. The presence of God was in a man, no longer in the tent, no longer in the temple, but in this man, same associations here. And now it is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. Just like in the beginning of the book of Genesis, where God walks with Adam and Eve as in the garden, resides with them. He will be with them and be their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And again, the historical sense, the sense of apocalyptic as a movement towards an eschaton being revealed here uh, and, and enhanced in this. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Again, inheritance is a historical sense. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second earth, the, le the lake of fire. And then we get the description of the new Jerusalem and the glory therein. Let me go on to the epilogue because we are almost concluded here. And I hear voices outside, but I want to get through this. And then comes the epilogue. Now the epilogue takes us back particularly towards the end to the fact that this is an epistle but unlike normal epistles it is important that this epistle not be understood just as any old letter nothing can be added to this letter there's nothing that may be added or taken away from it these words are faithful and true the lord of the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things that must take place Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. What does it mean keeps them? Preserves them, but also lives in accordance with them. To keep something is to be faithful to it. Now I saw and heard these things, but, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. He said, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. Because remember the, the, the message to John from Christ came through the intermediary of an angel. And now John's the intermediary to, uh, into, me, intermediary to us. And the written word is the intermediary to us. So don't re reverence the book in the sense that you think the book is God, but show reverence for it because it is a true witness of these things. Don't do that. And he says, I am coming quickly, my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He repeats what he said, therefore, blessed are those who do his commandments and they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. But, and again, reference to those who are not there. I am the root and the offspring of Jesus, of David rather, the bright and the morning star. Epithets, epic epithets, again. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him, him who hears say come and let him who thirsts come whoever desires let him take the water of life freely but then there comes the warning if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy now now it's referred to as a prophecy because it's referring to the future it's a revelation but it's going to be historically fulfilled god shall take away his part from the book of life from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book and he who testify these these things says, surely I'm coming quickly. That's the whole emphasis of the book of Revelation. It's been faster and faster. And I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Concludes with a 
thanks be to God. So it is a, 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 again, has a hymnic quality to the whole thing. Anyways, I'm done for today.